Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ernestus, for warming up uh, because I will need some of, your, uh, some of your effort to basically do an experiment. So we're going to, I'm Rokas, I'm from Contrarian Ventures, and uh, we invest in super founders uh, that are innovating in the space of energy and mobility. And we're going to talk about the latter, and it's a very, very exciting space to be at this point of time. And we're going to start with the experiment to put some things in perspective. Um, so when we're talking about mobility, it's, it's, it's us, you know, it's everywhere, right? So I want to ask a couple of questions. So how many of you uh, walked to this conference? If you can raise some hands. A couple, cool, uh, using your muscles. So how many of you dro drove with a car? Couple as well. How many of you actually came here with the ride hailing app like Taxify? Notice. Yeah, so it's probably winning of all these three. So what's interesting is mobility is actually, I think my slides should work. Yeah, cool. So mobility is actually was perceived as investors as it was going to change and re re revolutionize long time ago. So if, if someone knows Peter Thiel, who's one of the prominent investors in Facebook and co-founder of PayPal, he, in 2013, in Yale commencement speech, said, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters, which is, she's referring to Twitter. So the last five years were all about fintech, social, social, big social media companies like Facebook, uh, search engines, right? But there's not many things that actually happened in mobility since 1915 when Ford launched a uh, first serial car. So there is Tesla, right? But that's not much about it. So before, we can speak a lot about a lot of things in mobility sense, because mobility is actually everywhere. It touches every sector, pretty much. And we as investors really like it, because it's a very big market. It touches fintech, it touches payments, it touches certain spaces like public service, it touches OEMs who manufacture the cars, insurance industry. So it's a very large market, and investors obviously like large markets, because that's how we you know, grow unicorns and, and, and make a lot of money for our uh, investors in the funds. But it's not only about that. Before, in order to realize and talk about mobility, it's really hard, so we need to take a niche of it. That's why I ask questions about how you got here, because today we're going to talk actually about people's mobility. So how we as human beings actually commute. And that actually I borrowed from Oxford Dictionary. What does actually mean mobility, right? It's actually meaning easily and freely moving which when you think about it, and five years ago, you would have said, let's get a taxi. What do you usually say now when you want to get a taxi? You say, let's get Taxify, let's get Uber. So there's no taxi, there's, there's, there's a new concept of it, right? So it's completely redefined. Before it was waving your head in, in, in Fifth Avenue in New York, that was the definition of a taxi. Now it's a push of a button when you're down, going downstairs with the elevator from your hotel room. So it completely changed, and it integrated a lot of industries into that, insurance, OMs and a bunch of other things that contribute to this big ecosystem. What's interesting, we, in order to talk about it, we need to define it. So what's the mobility, right? So we go anything from our foot that we walk to airplanes, how we got here into this event if someone is coming from other countries. But the big, big interesting part to it, what we, where we are really excited as investors in this space, is the micro part. Because what's interesting about it is there is a massive shift towards the five years ago when we're saying, let's get a taxi, that was, let's own a car. It was a big thing in the US when you were 16 to own a car. You know, it was sort of a cheat It was here as well, I think. I got my license probably the first day when I turned 18. It was all about movement, independence of movement. And that independence of movement goes into a push of a button in your phone. And that's what's interesting. And this whole industry is completely shifting by these three interesting parts. It's called generations. And us millennials prefer to not own things anymore. That's part of the sharing economy theme, right? But what's interesting, it completely reversed the chat from the baby boomers, right? From the late 60s, our parents pretty much, right? To the millennials who are now preferred not to own a car. They prefer to own a smartphone. They have everything what they need there. What's interesting, so we as investors look in these spheres in three parts, according to the range of commute. So I just showed previously when we were defining the mobility, the big chunk of it is actually bikes and walking and, and, and the short, micro, it's called the micromobility. So it's up to five miles, so it's roughly like, what, seven and a half kilometers. Medium distance is where we use the ride hailing, right? So we use to go from our homes to our works, if we use Uber and the like of apps. 
And then it's long distance where it's sharing, right? In that part of touch, it's gonna be the most exciting, probably the most utopian, so that's autonomous cars. That's what's gonna help us to do it without drivers or ourselves driving the car. But there is obviously, we're gonna go from each of these parts and we're gonna break them down. So the first one that is the most exciting, I'm sure, I'm sure you saw or drove one, it's micromobility, so it's bikes or scooters. And the picture that you're seeing is in China, so it looks like it didn't go that well with them having these bikes floating around around China. So they put millions of bikes. They did the biggest experiment of all of our time. They put, they flooded it with money and they put these bikes out there. And that's what happened. So that doesn't look that great. But we'll see, nothing, not, not everything is that bad. So what's interesting is 60% of the commute actually happens in the microspace, so up to five miles. And that's very interesting because that's actually how we commute on a daily basis in the cities, right? So, this is the possible opportunity for these new emergent players, like scooter, scooter platforms and biking platforms. And uh, when you look at the US, it's already happening that way. So there's a whole universe of these companies now all around the world. Uh, we know Taxify launches scooters in Estonia, or at least they're planning to. They're targeting other markets. But there's in total 26 companies that have been launched over the course of one year. That's pretty insane. So investors did took notice. That actually happened the same with bike companies. So that's exactly the same. 16 companies across the whole world. And they're targeting, you know, multiple big markets. However, they're quite segregated. And why we like it as a VC, we're, we, we believe, you know, history does not repeat itself, it often rhymes. And what I mean by that, it often repeats itself in the growth curves. That's what we like. We like these steep curves, you know, we don't like this. We like this. <laughs> and this is happening in this space. So on the, on the chart, you see ride-sharing adoption compared to, Google, to Uber and um, Lyft. And that's, it's even steeper now. And on the, on, on the other side, you see Facebook, Google growth. And that's very replicable. That's users growth versus the ride growth. But that's their business difference in business models. So that's, that's why it's exciting. And and it's been primarily dominated by the two markets. So 75% of that share uh, of that market was captured by China and US. And it's like a big rivalry within these two countries in the mobility space as well, which we're gonna touch briefly later. Um, and it's all based on total addressable markets, so big markets. Investors really love big markets, you know? And that was reflected in funding. So it just literally appeared in 2017 in the micromobility space and bikes that started to pop. It went out of nowhere. It went from 300 million to 3 billion. And that's reoccurring because this year is gonna be even higher with all these big funding in Europe coming down and recent Lime round of 2.1 billion. And wh where's this, so people will just go, it's just a bunch of scooters that these guys collected, created this kind of cool platform and, and then they're worth a billion dollar? What the hell? But it's pretty funny because Lime actually reached 35 million rides and what's interesting, they, in one year, they managed to go from zero to 270 million revenue. That's a crazy number. That's why these monies flowed from investor side. They fueled the growth. Now Lime is in 140 cities across the world. That's a pretty crazy number when you take into account that you need to execute two, one city every two days. So imagine how many hiring you need to do. And why do we investors love it? One year from a modest valuation of 225 million to a billion dollar company. <laughs> that's pretty fast, I think. That's unprecedented fast. It took Uber, I think, four years to get to a billion. And these guys, one year. That's pretty nuts, I think. The next part where we're gonna go is extending that range. So going from micromobility to more favored means of transportation that we're currently using, ride hailing. So I'm sure you've seen these before. Uber, Lyft, Taxify. Good neighbors. We have, we have a billion dollar company nearby. That's great. We're in innovating in mobility from quite some time now. Uh, that's an interesting space as well because it's very much interrelated. So when we think about, we usually say Uber because that's the first company that was founded in that space. But there's quite a range of them. And they go in four different types actually. So multi-geography, single geography, multimodal, and local super apps. So WeChat actually could have easily integration to do a mobility and a cross range from ride hailing to other means of transportation. Um, 
And all they are seeking to be capturing basically bigger markets and being more functional to the users. What's crazy about it is when you think about it, numbers always speak for themselves. We can put like nice statements, but 1.2 billion people use ride hailing. That's one in every seven people in the world. And there's also 50 million jobs that have been created out of this phenomena. And that's what's really crazy, right? Like if you take put that taxi numbers, unfortunately I couldn't find the numbers there, it would be way, way smaller. So it just not only conquered the taxi as we know it, it created a new market for itself. And this is how it worked. So again, a very steep curve with a lot of competition in the space, fueled by a lot of money. So from 2009, from two companies, AUS, Uber, and my tax in Israel, we went to having 16 players in that universe. And you know what? They're very well funded. And as we know it, I think some of you might know because you're in tech space, but Taxify got investment from Didi. And when we look at it, out of that 1.2 billion right hailing users, more than half of it is actually in China. And that's why I refer to big markets. So Uber, as we know it, it's, it's massive, but compared to Didi, it's nothing. And that was followed by funding. So these companies not only made unicorns, they made decatons in less than six years. So they went to over seven, eight digits, sorry, uh, valuations. Um, and, you know, you would say it's crazy how these companies go and overgrow even someone market capitalization like Ford being someone without owning a single car or manufacturing one. But that's crazy because it's fueled by growth. But what's interesting, if we take micromobility as a side, Uber is not just an app that gives you riding. They're actually entering every single space to be the superpower in the mobility space, to be your single point of contact to travel. It's followed by Taxify and others. And somewhat ones are moving faster than the others, but that's the ultimate game. So they are also entering micromobility space. So they're not only just taking your car, they're trying to take the whole tunnel how you travel and you understand traveling yourself. And then the third one is what I believe is the most exciting one, is the utopian play, so autonomous cars. That changes completely the model that we previously spoke in both micromobility and, and, and ride hailing, because there's no driver. So those 50 million drivers, someone one day might disappear. So as excited as I was that there was job creation, it might disappear one day very easily with a fiction of a turn off. <laughs> so we've seen attempts to, you know, to see the future, like Peter Thiel, you know, with flying cars. There's been more attempts. There was attempts in late 50s to people imagine that the cars would drive itself, and there was multiple attempts to actually even materialize them. So that's an advertising by GM in 1950s in New York Mobility Congress. Uh, I'm sure you know the movie Knight uh, Rider, which is like this car with David Dusselfoss, all young, driving the car, and then the car is smart, so it makes decisions and fights for the better future. And obviously, back to the future, so flying cars. It actually expected that there would be one in 2016 or 15, I think. None of this happened, right? But so we want to understand where we are now. And it's been tried. So there's, to understand mobility in autonomy perspective, there's six layers, uh, five layers how we define mobility. So defining mobility from just having an autopilot that was created by Chrysler back in the 60s to having a massive gap by Toyota being the first one to actually do it in 2003. So they did it ultimately uninterrupted parking. And then Tesla actually came back in 2014 and showed the world that this can actually be done in realistically without the driver to be operated in car, but not in full autonomy. So when we speak of autonomy, it's very important to understand where we are. So Waymo is actually the newest company in that space that managed to crack that down, and they've been actually operating car for quite some time, since 2011. So how far from reality, where's that question mark put when we actually can have operating fully autonomous car on the road? Because there's a lot of regulatory framework to that. So, you know, uh, I think it's pretty far. And you know why? Because there's so many companies innovating in that space. There's already 62 companies operating in the valley uh, driving, testing autonomous cars. There's 1,000 cars on the road in California alone. And this race is becoming between two countries, actually, China and US. That's where the regulatory framework was actually the most favored one. And that's what drives this innovation. 
And that was followed again by investors. It's a big market. And investors, again, love big market. So there's a lot of money that has been raised. So I was my partner in California two weeks ago, and we met a team, Zooks, which raised 800 million, surprisingly. You go in the office, of all the meetings that we had, that was the most exciting one. You go in the office, and everyone is running around everywhere. It feels like there's buzz. They're, they're doing something there, right? So they created a super cool car, which, which is basically going to be launched soon. And uh, it, it's, they reinvented the car, basically. And, uh, and they're growing, they're hiring people, it's, it's lively, so... And they think that they're gonna have this iPhone inception point, you know? Suddenly one day we wake up and it's like, wow, this, this just changed, this phone is, doesn't look like, you know, when Apple was like, Nokia, cool, iPhone, wow, that's something new, I can touch it. Uh, so Waymo was primarily one of the dominant power that, you know, was the leader. So when we say Waymo, it's actually Google. So it was Google X internal project, that they were doing in their secret lab, and they actually acquired this company, Waymo, and that became Waymo. So Waymo equals Google, so no one, if no one knows, that's, that's, that's the leading power in that space. And what's interesting how the autonomous cars are done these days is very, it's very rigid. It's just a normal car with a bunch of sensors, cameras, lidars. It's not, it doesn't look sexy. So when I said we met the team that is building something different to a car, it's probably gonna look like something like this. And that completely redefines mobility as we know it from a couple of points. The fact that car does not become a mean of transportation anymore. It becomes a place where you book a meeting and it takes you with someone and you're having a front-to-front -front conversation. It becomes completely redefined as a space. It does not, it's, it's, it's just a commodity. It doesn't matter how and what you do with it. It's just, it's just a way of you moving and being more efficient. So again, when we go to Oxford definition, it's easier and efficient. And what we really care as investors, because it's really hard to top down these massive rounds of funding, we care about a lot about data. To put it in perspective, it's a case done by McKinsey, 4,000 gigabytes every day by a single car. You imagine how big is that? So that's, as they say, 2,666 internet users. There's a lot of data that's gonna be created out of that. So before we had a, just one Google car doing mapping, right? Suddenly we wake up to a world where there's all these cars taking all this data from all around the world. And share model for Uber or taxi suddenly change. There's no driver. And we're very close to that break-even point. So where does it leave us? We might find ourselves in a world where we just take, sit, take a seat, sit back, relax, and enjoy what our private drive is driven by AI. There's no human there. You do it on demand in one app, and it's happening now. It's not, it's tomorrow. A lot of these companies are very secretive. So when we spoke about Zooks, they launched their second prototype in public only a year ago. They've been working on it for seven years. And why is that? Because everyone wants to be the first and they don't want secrets to leak. So that's why public is very uninformed that this is actually happening, even though this is all over the place. So Uber is not only a ride hailing now, they're, they're ride sharing, they're delivery. They're doing your eat, Uber Eats in some certain countries. Micromobility, probably gonna go in car sharing. And they're actually invested four billion in autonomous vehicle R&D. So we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. Funnily enough, last year Boeing launched a flying car, first test, so we're, Peter Thiel was skeptical or optimistic, I don't know, I can get it in his head, but we got there and it took six years. So I hope next time I'll be here on, after six years, when I'm gonna ask you how you got here, there's gonna be a bunch of people that are gonna raise hands that they got into autonomous car. So thank you for your time, uh, and uh, I hope we'll get there.